You're listening to Everything Environment by Manga Bay India. I visited a small village in Nuwapara district of Odisha which was electrified for the first time through solar energy through this decentralized model. That's Manga Bay India staff reporter Manish Kumar. He visited the village in 2018, the year it got an electricity connection. The decentralized model he referred to is a small scale energy generation unit that delivers energy locally. In this case, a cluster of solar panels was installed in the village. Decentralized renewable energy systems are primarily independent of the central power grid. The off-grid rooftop solar panels we see over houses are also an example of a decentralized model. If you're listening to us from a metro, you would have several things to worry about, but electricity might not be one of them. But imagine the things at stake due to the lack of energy access. Education, security, healthcare, and so on. Lack of energy access also limits the rural economy. but reliable electricity creates an infrastructure for rural entrepreneurs and gives people a chance to work on their aspirations decentralized renewable energy applications or as we will call them in this episode dre applications have done just that in several parts of rural india it's almost like they are making their own power and then they are using their own power to run their own machines women in jharkhand are using solar powered silk spinning machines to improve their lives A group of women in Odisha uses a solar run lac processing unit to produce edible oil. Solar energy holds the most prominent share in India's DRE capacity. Solar irrigation pumps, solar dryers, solar flour mills, solar cold storage units and so on. However, DRE livelihood applications could also be run by wind, micro hydro and biomass. According to one report, there is a market of around 53 billion US dollars for such applications. While DR is not a silver bullet for all rural energy and employment issues, it can play a significant role in the right direction. In this episode, we will look at some DR applications and their ability to transform lives by creating jobs, business opportunities and also the hurdles they face. I am Mayank Agarwal, contributing editor at Manga Bay India. We are an online publication dedicated to bringing you stories on science and the environment in India. In our special podcast series Gigawatt We will explore some of the biggest questions, challenges and opportunities in India's transition from fossil fuels to clean energy sources. Manish Kumar has visited Jharkhand, Bihar, Odisha and Telangana among other states to report for Manga Bay India's clean energy series. You can get the series link in the show notes. It tells us about a change underway in a remote village called Gunnia in Jharkhand's Gumla district. so i saw mustard processing unit in one village then there was cold storage also run by solar energy there were ice cream processing unit and wheat processing unit wheat crushing unit so different types of uh, small enterprises totally fueled by solar energy started coming up and a lot of them had women as representatives Manish also says that one or two villages in Gumla had a cluster of solar panels. The power generated from this small solar setup is sent to households and all the small businesses and industries in the vicinity. Each household they have a meter, they have a prepaid meter, they pay in advance and then they operate. They recharge it with around 200 to 250 rupees per month and they use it for the whole month. Now, Gumla does have a conventional grid connection. but it's often unreliable villagers told me that there was erratic supply of electricity so there was problem in getting the electricity 24 hours so when through this charitable organization melinda foundation they got a chance to get electricity from like conventional sources of energy plus they started having an additional source of energy from solar so a woman who was working in one such mustard processing unit told me ki initially we used to get some amount from agriculture but now because we have all 10 women have come together to start a mustard processing unit so whatever extra amount of money i can get now i can plan to invest in a good education of my children i can send my children to nearby cities for a good education that we could not do in our lifetime because we were totally dependent on agriculture With farming becoming highly unpredictable due to various reasons, many consider DRE based jobs as an alternate source of income. We spoke to Anant Arvamudan from Powering Livelihoods, 
a program that has enabled DRE solutions to take off in rural areas. This joint program between Policy Research Institute, CEEW, and Wilgro Innovation Foundation supports multiple enterprises for the large-scale deployment of clean energy-powered appliances for livelihoods. Today, when we speak about entrepreneurship, we think a lot about the startup and the startup ecosystem, which is primarily based around cities, right? But how do we create entrepreneurs at a village level, at every community level, right? For this, you know, of course, that entrepreneurial spirit has to be there, which is there in plenty if you look at it uh, in our country. But also the necessary kind of infrastructure has to be there. Some of the early studies which preceded powering livelihoods actually showed that the major roadblock encountered by rural entrepreneurs was lack of access to reliable electricity. Now, I'm choosing the words very carefully because today the grid has penetrated almost every part of the country. However, because of the vastness of the country, because of the remoteness of certain areas and communities, because of various other factors which cause disruptions of power. Imagine a cold storage unit for fresh fruits going off or a textile power loom that stops working for several hours. Power cuts for hours or a lack of affordable electricity can be bad for any business. I think the reliability of electricity has been an issue and decentralized renewable energy can be that one factor which provides reliable, clean energy to rural communities to you know, develop livelihood applications. While no doubt the grid is penetrating everywhere, typically the focus has been on households. So households have light, great, okay. But when you go to a farm, right, not, I mean, very a much smaller percentage of the farmlands actually have, you know, power, right? Those, of course, who are lucky enough to have, say, pumps or pump sets will have access to power. But what if you want to set up a small processing plant right next to where you're doing the harvest? What if you want to have a cold storage unit, you know, very close to your field where you can store the fresh fruit or the fresh vegetables after they are plucked, right? And, you know, by doing this, you may be actually able to get a much better value for the produce rather than selling it off at kind of distressed prices. One of the entrepreneurs in our program has developed a a fodder growing station. Now, this is this uses some principles of hydroponics. And it uses solar energy to power the whole thing. So basically, by setting up this unit in a household, one can generate enough fodder to feed four cattle a day. And since it's a modular unit, you can scale it up to you know to feed as many cattle as you want. Or you can sell that fodder to people who have cattle and make money on it. Right now, what we observe is that if such a unit is set up in a house, typically it is most beneficial to the women of that household because they tend to spend more time in and around home. And therefore, a lot of women entrepreneurs who are now dealing in cattle fodder have actually been enabled and empowered by decentralized renewable energy. Just look at the alternative. You know, earlier in earlier times, you know, the fodder collection was actually the job of the woman. They used to go out far away from the house and collect the fodder. That is just for their own cattle. Whereas now, not only can they grow the fodder for their own cattle, but they can also grow excess and sell it. Funded by various foundations and the UK government. Anand says that powering livelihoods doesn't just focus on the equipment because the problem doesn't end there. It also creates an ecosystem that helps with finance, partnerships and better product distribution. The program supports a company called Resham Sutra that works with rural silk yarn producers and fabric weavers and provides solar powered machines. Our next voice on this episode is Kunal Vaid, director of Resham Sutra. We saw that the situation, the work situation for these people was extremely bad. For example, women were still making silk yarn by rolling it on their thigh, which is a very painful process and leads to lifelong disabilities. So we started designing machines that would help them to increase their productivity, that would help them to make better quality material, and also to get rid of all the problems, all the physical and mental stress that they had to go through in doing their day-to-day work. So we now have 12 different products that help these rural yarn producers and fabric weavers to do their work in a better way. And then apart from this, we also offer machines for weaving. We have solar powered loom and accessories related to that. There is a series of uh, processes that the material has to go through before making the fabric. So we have machines for the entire value chain. It's almost like they're making their own power and then they're using their own power to run their own machines. Renewable energy, solar power was a need that came from the customer. It is not something that we are trying to impose from the top because we realize that regular income is a necessity for them. 
is a strong need. Resham Sutra started in 2016. It works across 300 villages in Central, South, East and Northeast India, reaching about 16,000 people. One of our customers, she was uh, in a prison in Bilaspur. She was imprisoned uh, as a life uh, imprisoned uh, person. She wanted to work because in the prison also you're supposed to earn your living. So somehow one of our uh, field partners there managed to get in touch with her. And then uh, she picked up the job of making silk yarn while she was in the prison. And then over a few months and years, she became a trainer for us. She started teaching other women in the prison how to make silk yarn. And then uh, because of her uh, good conduct, she was able to get out early and she continues to work with us as a trainer. Now she travels all over the country and then she trains other people. Our products, they start at about uh, 15,000 rupees for a machine, including the solar power system. And then at the higher end, they go up to about uh, 60 to 70,000 rupees. And uh, typically, the payback period for any of our products, the way that the products are designed is that it is less than a year. So we have tie-ups with the financing agencies also. So most of our customers are not able to afford these products outright. So we have EMI options available. So for which uh, the financing agencies come in and they offer a loan, a pretty low monthly payment from the customers. Like Resham Sutra, driven by the motivation to eliminate drudgery and increase income, Abhishek Pathak founded Greenware. This social enterprise helps rural women to produce cotton and silk yarn with solar charkhas. A charkha is a traditional spinning wheel for spinning thread or yarn from fibers. Greenware claims that solar charkhas can produce four times more yarn than a manual new model charkha. And to ensure a market for this increased quantity of yarn, the company supplies it to weavers and the fabric produced is also stitched into garments at Greenware's manufacturing unit. We are currently giving employment to 272 artisans full-time at one facility uh, which we have uh, established in Safedabad, Barabanki, in Uttar Pradesh. 3,500 women were trained on spinning of solar charkhas in four states, UP, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, and Gujarat. In India, the power loom sector constitutes of, you know, more than 66% of market share of, uh, you know, if we talk about domestic uh, textile market. And these power looms are mostly installed at household base level only, and that too in traditional textile clusters. So that's how, uh, you know, we started reaching out to these weavers that, you know, if you upgrade your power looms into solar looms, or uh, we started introducing solar looms to hand loom weavers, that if you start working on these, we can ensure minimum 300 days work for you. So decentralized DRE uh, units have, uh, you know, played very phenomenal role in our, uh, you know, definition or origin of greenware. If you talk about the opportunities ahead or if you talk about the, uh, the capacity it can hold, just imagine that if the 5% villages of India become solar charkha clusters, you know, that makes around 30,000 villages. If 30,000 villages become solar charkha mini clusters, they can actually hold 60% of uh, domestic textile production of India currently. There is a market of around 53 billion US dollar for DRE applications in rural areas. A 2017 survey of DRE companies in India revealed that the sector provided direct employment to over 3 lakh people in both formal and informal jobs. The number of people is over double if we calculate the jobs created indirectly due to improved electricity access. DRE has an essential role in another energy intensive sector, agriculture. India's agriculture sector accounts for 22% of the total power consumed in India. We are increasingly turning to solar power in rural areas to decrease this burden. Solar power irrigation pumps have replaced conventional, expensive, polluting pumps that run on diesel or grid-connected electricity. Manish says that the sight of rows of glass panels in the middle of fields is getting more frequent during his trips. But he still hasn't got used to it. From his interaction with farmers, he says that while solar pumps have helped save on diesel and kerosene expenses, financial assistance and subsidies have been significant drivers for the switch. As of now, the national and state governments have their eyes locked on mega solar 
wind and hydro projects. Startups and civil society are playing a significant role in taking DRE applications to India's hinterlands. India will require an annual DRE investment of 18 billion US dollars by 2024 to meet its sustainable energy targets, a 10 times increase from current levels. Kunal from Resham Sutra, Abhishek from Greenware, and Anand from Powering Livelihoods all echo similar thoughts on areas that needs more work and government support. First, spreading awareness and building trust among people about the products. I see several of the progressive states who are uh, looking at uh, decentralized renewable energy, doing a lot of promotions around how these solutions can actually be deployed, you know, what are what are the costs, what are the schemes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So many states today through their rural livelihood missions are promoting the decentralized renewable energy-based livelihoods and I think this trend should definitely continue. Second, providing more access to finance to purchase DRE equipment. So as the state-run or the nationalized banks uh, step into the picture and start providing loans against which these DRE equipment can be purchased, we'll see a huge spike in, in their usage. And I think this is something that um, definitely the governments can do through the various schemes which they bring about. And third, creating a market and distribution network for the products that are produced. When you have all this fresh produce, new improved products coming out from villages, which was not the case earlier and which have been enabled by decentralized renewable energy, it is very important that corporates now start encouraging these things, right? And just think of this beautiful story behind it, right? When if an organic chain wants to now start selling products which are actually produced by solar energy, right? It's not just that it's organic, but it's also produced completely by clean energy. So this kind of the market linkage where some of these products of high quality and, you know, with a very clean track record, if they can be taken and sold in urban areas and that some of that premium be passed on to the producers, right? This will be a huge catalyst for the spread of DRE-based livelihoods. Kunal sees a space for product innovation too. Availability of uh, good, well-designed products and solutions for the villages, which are specifically designed for their need. We have seen some changes. We are seeing more and more things coming in, but then much more is needed. Our reports for the Clean Energy series revealed a common issue plaguing decentralized solar projects. For instance, in the Sundarbans, Monga Bay India contributor Sigdendu Bhattacharya reported that off-grid solar plants that once powered islands, its local shops and offices now lie defunct, standing like relics of the past. Manish Kumar wrote about a solar power station in Bihar's first solar village that became a makeshift cattle shed. What led to the failure of these once ambitious projects? Whatever I have seen in different areas that when these solar assets are not well maintained or well kept, not taken care by people, when the local communities are not uh, taken into confidence, when their participation is not uh, ensured. So many of such projects have failed on the ground despite uh, much talks about how much energy they can save, how much beneficial it could be. The experts tell us that the solar panels have a shelf life of around 15 years. But I have seen that many projects in different parts of India have failed within three years or five years because there is no maintenance from the governments or the agencies who were deployed to install such products. So in Gumla, there was a man deployed full time, there was protection, there was maintenance and the local communities were taken into confidence. In early 2022, the Indian government released a framework for promoting DRE livelihood applications. It states that these applications should be integrated into the different government schemes run by the ministries to create sustainable jobs. A lot of focus today being put on larger scale power plants and how they can contribute to India's clean energy ambitions and also our commitments in terms of preventing global warming and so on. However, I think, you know, very, very less attention is actually being paid to the needs of rural communities and how energy can be a major catalyst in stepping up the opportunities to create livelihoods in rural areas. Please share this episode with your friends and family or on social media. This show was produced and scripted by my colleague Karthik Chandramoli, edited and mixed by Tejas Dayanand Sagar, copy edits by Priyanka Shankar, we got production assistance from Ayushi Kothari, and the Gigawatt artwork is by Pooja Gupta. We will be out with another episode of Gigawatt soon. Take care.